I'm a research scientist. Uh, my background is in uh, medical devices and development. My PhD was through the University of Washington uh, in the late 90s and I developed fiber optic and laser based instrumentation. And what we do at Ondine is to develop laser based photodynamic systems for um, killing of bacteria and other infections in the human body. So it's a combination of dye chemistries, lasers, fiber optics, all the things that I love to play with. Bacteria have 3,000 genes, give or take, only half of which are conscripted to meet present day requirements. The other half represent an enormous evolutionary storehouse of knowledge um, as to how to defeat things that uh, were available and were around as antimicrobials uh, eons ago. Uh, as a result, when bacteria see these modern synthetic antimicrobials, such as the newer antibiotics, they result, um, they, they're often killed, but those that are not killed have upregulated genes to defeat those antimicrobials. And so resistance is a terrible problem with antibiotics. Uh, our technology is essentially focused on elimination of the resistance aspect so that you can use it again and again without fear of the technology losing potency. That's really the fundamental aspect, how to create a rapid, effective microbicide that doesn't harm human tissue and at the same time does not generate resistance. Paradoxically, given my prior answer about um, evolving beyond conventional antimicrobials, uh, we found that the combinations of photodynamic approaches and conventional approaches have got some startling um, aspects of synergy. And indeed, um, we've added standard antimicrobials that no longer function well under any conditions to photodynamics, either in parallel, along with, or serially, before or after, and found there to be remarkable effects, synergistic effects. In fact, we've been able to regenerate susceptibility to antibiotics that have long ago failed uh, by using a photodynamic precursor or uh, adjunctive process so that the bacteria begin to be resensitive, they're resensitized to the, to the old antimicrobial. That's really been an area where we've been interested in further development. If we culture the inside surface of a ventilator tube, for example, when it's been present for, say, three or four days, uh, there will be a mixed species biofilm. Pretty thick, wadgy slime film of bacteria. You'll find Staphylococcus aureus, Pseudomonas, and a host of other species there. But as I said, the microbes rely on the presence of anchor species, which create adhesion to the surface, promote mid-stage colonizers, um, the adhesion between bacteria, the chemical discussion that the bacteria have between themselves and with the host. And those species can number in the hundreds. In the oral cavity, for example, in periodontal disease, where these infections occur between the gum and the tooth, there are more than 500 species that have been enumerated, but there a gram-negative called Porphyromonas gingivalis is often implicated in the acute phase of periodontal disease um, destruction. But streptococcal species, staphylococcal species, numerous different Prevotella type species exist which all are required to form this infection. Knock out some of the anchor species or even some of the lesser species and the film starts to degenerate under the influence of these um, removals. Uh, you really do need to have, or the film is stabilized by the presence of these multi-species and eliminating only a fraction can result in a significantly enhanced susceptibility to the human immune system. I think the, the key word is chronic. Um, we know that the majority, uh, if not all, bacteria can, within the right environmental constraints, form biofilm. Therefore, uh, with enough substrate um, in terms of metabolic process available, these bugs will ultimately clump together into a biofilm form. Uh, it, it's a form that produces resistance to attack 
by the host and by external antimicrobials. The bacteria are symbiotic, synergistic with one another within the film. They're likely to head in that direction. The number of 80% uh, is probably reasonable. I've seen numbers varying from 30 to that number 80. But I would say that in our work, it's somewhere in the 70% range. These are the so-called commensal or good bacteria that we are aware are very important in the science of probiotics. Often they're lactobacilli responsible for uh, aiding digestion in the gut and so forth. Absence of those bacteria can lead to a whole range of conditions, some of which are not well understood today. But in particular, it is when those bacteria get out of balance, if you will. Uh, we tend to use more technical terms than that. When the microflora shifts from a predominantly gram-positive to a gram-negative uh, cross-section, we tend to see the development of more pathogenic infection and that's when uh, some external help is often required. From our perspective, we, we really only recognize, uh, as I said, with the exception of transient e events, we recognize most infections are biofilm-based. There are a whole lot more than 17 million infections occurring in the United States today. So, uh, you know, that would be a remarkably, in my view, would be a remarkably conservative number. We think we'll have great impact in chronically acquired um, infections in the hospital, and that is in, in uh, MRSA infection in the, or colonization in the anterior nose, the lower portion of the nose. Forty percent of us have staphylococcus in the anterior nose. Uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It happens to be uh, phenotype dependent. Do some humans have this, some don't. But in a percentage of those cases, five or six percent, those staphylococci have acquired the gene for resistance and have in fact required high level resistance to a multiplicity of antimicrobials, antibiotics. Those are the dangerous ones because those when breathed onto open wounds or transmitted between patients or to healthcare workers, patient facing healthcare workers, those are the ones that tend to be rather difficult to treat if the patient does develop an infection. And in the case of a hip, or an open thorax procedure, we're talking about over $100,000 to treat that infection. So we put a probe in before, and we say, oh, there's a six or seven or eight millimeter hole there where bugs have burrowed between the gum and the tooth. And we apply the therapy, and six weeks later, we remeasure that hole, and we find it's been reduced by three, four millimeters. Uh, in many cases, we can actually take pockets that have otherwise been bleeding, reservoirs of infection, and reduce them to the point where they no longer need any treatment. Now, that has a number of consequences. First of all, the patient doesn't keep coming back for treatment in that site. And secondly, and as importantly, bacteria are not translocating from those sites to the systemic vasculature. And periodontal disease and other chronic infections have been implicated in these very dangerous upregulation of inflammation markers. Um, these are blood-borne chemicals that affect the ability of the body to fight other disease, to fight internal pathological conditions such as diabetes, or to uh, generate cardiovascular disturbances such as atherosclerosis and the process of heart disease which afflicts so many Americans. Now, almost two in 10 people are coming in to a hospital and leaving with an infection that may be far worse than the reason they presented to the hospital. As that understanding occurs, we think there's going to be more of a commercial shift to addressing a problem which has really been relatively uh, not well understood. And as we see those commercial shifts occurring, we think there will be increased appetite for alternative technologies that don't rely on some of the blockbuster antibiotics of the past, but which are beginning to fail. After all, if we can just minimize the amount of antibiotics that are being used, we've done a great job. But if we can both minimize and provide for an alternative therapeutic pathway, I think we can all go home happy.